A pretty cool application of the Van Toff equation is seen in biology. And what I'll do in this video is go over how we can interpret the melting of DNA from a double-stranded form into a single-stranded form uh, provides a good example by which we can analyze a generic uh, binding event uh, in practice and how we uh, derive the enthalpy of this particular re uh, reaction or binding, as well as the entropy involved using the Van Toff equation. And so to uh, give a background on how scientists use this in practice, engineers, uh, we'll begin by looking at the structure of DNA. And we know how DNA has the four base pairs, A, T, G, C, and the complementary strand uh, would look like this. Um, there is a very unique property to DNA in that adenine thymine will form two hydrogen uh, bonds between um, the complementary strands, but uh, GC base pairs will actually form three. And the consequence of having uh, three hydrogen bonds instead of two is that as we have increased the temperature of our solution, the DNA that exists in double-stranded form will melt at a different temperature due to a varying concentration of GC base pairs. And so uh, what I mean by that is if we consider a generic reaction, double-stranded DNA becoming single-stranded DNA, uh, there will be a K forward as well as a K reverse reaction. And this is dictated by the temperature that our solution is at. And uh, defining an equilibrium constant K, we know that is equivalent to the concentration of your products, in this case, single-stranded DNA, divided by the concentration of your reactants, DS DNA. And so what we do is turn to the Van Toff equation, uh, which will allow us to um, derive what um, the uh, enthalpy of this reaction, as well as the entropy of this reaction, uh, will be. And so uh, to do that, we will first go to one of the laws of thermodynamics, which tells us that in general, the Gibbs free energy of a reaction is equivalent to the uh, delta H of that reaction minus temperature times the change in entropy. This is a law that will always apply as the law of thermodynamics. But at equilibrium, uh, there is an additional relationship that tells us that uh, delta G, not the Gibbs free energy at equilibrium, is equivalent to minus RT natural log of K, where K is this equilibrium constant. And if we let our solution reach equilibrium, in which the rate forward equals the rate reverse, the uh, rate that double-stranded DNA is becoming single-stranded DNA, and single-stranded DNA is re-annealing back into double-stranded DNA, these two equations uh, are equal to each other, and we arrive at the Van Hoff equation. If we now isolate and algebraically uh, solve for ln natural log of uh, the equilibrium constant k, what we will find is that ln k is equal to minus the heat of reaction divided by the uh, gas constant R times 1 over T plus the entropy of the reaction divided by R, and these are at equilibrium. So we put a not to uh, denote that. And what we'll see is that this is now in the form, form of a linear uh, equation, y is equal to m times x plus b. And so if we were to plot uh, 1 over t on the uh, x-axis and natural log of k on the y-axis, and I'll draw this slightly better. Um, if we plotted it, what we would see is we should get some kind of linear relationship in which the slope m is equal to minus 
the heat of reaction over R and the Y intercept is equal to the entropy divided by R. And so the key takeaway is that we can solve for these two parameters, um, entropy as well as enthalpy of the reaction um, that is occurring. And so the next question to ask is, in practice, we can measure temperature quite readily with a thermometer, but how do we actually figure out what uh, our equilibrium constant K is? And so this is a bit more tricky. And so what we do in uh, biology and, and chemistry is we turn to, or we may turn to something referred to as a spectrophotometer. And what this spectrophotometer uh, will do if we're looking at DNA in particular, is it will give us some kind of absorbance value, which we can correlate to a concentration um, or a relative concentration of double-stranded to single-stranded DNA. So this gives us a uh, ratio of DS to NS, or sorry, uh, single-stranded DNA. And so what I mean by that is uh, if we go back to the core uh, chemical model or structure of uh, these base pairs, A, T, G, C, uh, we will be able to draw resonance structures when um, they're in their single-stranded form. So single-stranded DNA can form resonance structures, um, but double-stranded DNA can't the presence of the hydrogen bonds that exist while DNA is in the double-stranded form prevent resonance structures from occurring. And uh, this means the electrons aren't able to uh, conjugate and rearrange themselves. Um, so this has an effect of changing the absorbance. And so resonance structures uh, change how light interacts with DNA, and to be more specific, resonance structures uh, will cause DNA, uh, resonance structures will cause more light to be absorbed. So more resonance equals more absorption. And so uh, what we do is if we took a spectrophotometer and analyzed how the absorption at some particular wavelength is evolving as a function of time, we will get plots that look like this. And so on our x-axis, we would plot temperature. This could be degrees Celsius, for instance. And on the y-axis, we would plot absorbance, which is uh, a dimensionless value um, with arbitrary units, but it would be at some particular wavelength. Typically, it'll be 260 nanometers. And uh, what we'll find is that if we had a cuvette with our solution of double-stranded and single-stranded DNA in it, um, as we increase temperature, we'll get some kind of plot that is linear, and then it will have an increase, and then it will taper off and then um, to a new plateau, uh, a new absorption value. And so what we do is this is the single-stranded DNA form after we've increased the temperature high enough to the point that all of the DNA that exists is in its single-stranded form. It's able to form resonance structures and absorb a lot more light than it did in its double-stranded DNA form. And uh, what we're able to do with this information is we are very interested in this region here. Um, between the double-stranded, the difference in absorbance between the double-stranded and single-stranded forms. And so if we look at the midpoint of this value, this tells us that the fraction of single-stranded DNA at that point is equal to 0 0.5. The fraction of double-stranded uh, DNA at that point is also equal to 0 0.5. And then another thing we'll say commonly is we'll define this to be the melting point um, of that particular DNA sequence because every DNA sequence um, may have a, a different concentration of G, C, and A, T base pairs. Um, so the melting point will vary, and this is a way we can actually identify uh, DNA sequences uh, fairly quickly. Um, 
But what we're able to do is also say, if we know that that's the midpoint, if that's 0 0.5, we can look at the midpoints between those two points and uh, determine these ratios where this refers to no single-stranded DNA and one refers to all single-stranded DNA at which um, everything's been completely melted. And if we look at the temperatures at which um, this happens, um, ideally we would be looking at the 0.75 and 0.25 values. Uh, we will be able to uh, get, I'll call that T3, um, our thermodynamic values from this equation. And so the a key assumption we'll make at this point to be able to carry on with our math is we'll assume that this portion of our graph here is linear. So assume a linear relationship between uh, the temperature and absorbance, absorbance um, in this region of interest. And doing this allows us to uh, generate the following table. And so we'll know how, what the temperature is. Uh, and so in this case, we would know T1, T melt, and T3. We would know the fraction of single-stranded DNA that exists at each one of those regions. Uh, so at this point, just from eyeballing, or you can be a bit more precise and use actual uh, length values, uh, we can determine um, what the uh, concentration is. But here at T1, we know that we are about one quarter of the way to the uh, new plateau. So we're 0.25. Um, will be the fraction of single-stranded DNA. We know at our melting temperature, we're at 0.5, and we know that at T3, we were approximately three quarters of the way to the new plateau. And um, with those values, we can now define what the fraction of double-stranded DNA is, which is nothing more than one minus the fraction of single-stranded DNA. And that will be equivalent to 0 0.75, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, and with these fractions, we can now find what the equilibrium value K is um, as a function of temperature, which is the key takeaway from this. And so uh, K, as we'll recall earlier, was defined to be the fraction of your products, in this case, the fraction of single-stranded DNA divided by the fraction of double-stranded DNA. And uh, what these values will correspond to would be one-third, one, and three. And uh, we would, in Excel, for instance, generate another column, uh, 1 over t, and let that be equal to 1 over t1, 1 over tm, and 1 over t3. And uh, we also want to plot the natural log of our equilibrium constant uh, k, and so um, that would have unique values assigned to that. And with these two final rows, we would generate our plot with one over temperature on the x-axis, as well as the natural log of k on the y-axis. And we would fit a line to this in Excel. We would end up with something y equals mx plus b. Uh, from this b value, we can figure out what our entropy um, of this reaction is because uh, B, as we'll recall, was equivalent to uh, the entropy divided by R, so we would multiply both sides by the ideal gas constant. R is equal to 8.314 joules per mole per Kelvin. And we can also use the slope M, which was equivalent to minus uh, the enthalpy of reaction over R, and evaluate what uh, enthalpy will be. And uh, from these values, we have now been able to derive what the enthalpy of melting as well as the entropy of melting is for this particular strand of DNA based on spectrophotometer readings as well as the known temperature at each one of those values. And so a final note to make is that um, we are analyzing the uh, equilibrium data here. We are not 
we have no knowledge of the actual kinetics involved. Um, so uh, that is a key takeaway. Uh, we have learned nothing from this about how quickly the double-stranded DNA is melting into single-stranded DNA or vice versa, but we do have an idea of um, what kind of equilibrium conditions there are and what the enthalpy and entropy of this uh, melting reaction uh, should be. And so I hope this clarifies things and provides a good basis as to the thermodynamics uh, we can apply when we're analyzing uh, biological reactions. Let me know if you have any questions and thanks for watching.